Yeah. Uh, you know, you and I live in a culture and in a world that is saturated with the idea that, you know, if it looks good, it must be okay. If it sounds good, it must be right. If it feels good, go ahead and do it. And I'm, I'm going to begin a whole sermon series uh, entitled True-ish, uh, because you, we live in a world where, again, if it looks good, if it sounds good, if it feels good, you know, it must be okay, but it must be right. Must be true. <coughs> Stephen Colbert, the American commentator and comedian, a couple of years ago coined a new term that has actually made it into the uh, into the American lexicon called truthiness, where we just kind of live in a in a world uh, that's that's really not about things that are true, but about truthiness. They sound good, they look good, they feel good, and so we just kind of we kind of go with it. But I want you to know this morning that as Christians, you and I stand based upon Jesus Christ really in, in opposition to truthish, to truthiness. And we're going to look at a couple of statements that Jesus makes that are recorded for us, both in the, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus reminds us that there is truth. There is absolute truth. And that it is embodied in Him. And so for the next few weeks, I want us to think about what does that mean? What does that mean to us uh, as, uh, as believers? And so from John chapter 18, we have Jesus being interrogated before Pilate. And we're going to take just a little snippet of that from John 18. Pilate says to Jesus, you are king then. And Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to what? The truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And then Pilate asks a great kind of practical but existential question. He says, what is truth? What is truth? And you know, that question is still with us today. It is, a, it is a kind of timeless question. What is truth? In John chapter 14, Jesus is preparing his disciples for that point in time that's, that's quickly approaching where he will no longer be with them physically. He, he, he's going to not be present with them. He had been walking with them and teaching them, investing himself in them for for almost three years, and so he, he knows that his time is coming here on, on earth, and so he wants to prepare them for that. And so he begins to share with them words of hope and confidence and, and promise, and uh, begins to tell them about what's going to happen and, and, and that they might be prepared for that. And in John chapter 14, and I'm going to go a couple verses beyond what's printed in the worship bulletin this morning, because it's critical that, that we absorb what Jesus says here. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him critically important passage in understanding from a Christian perspective truth, the truth. <coughs> you know, what you and I believe is critical. What you and I believe determines what we do, determines how we behave, determines the attitudes that we have. And so this business about understanding what we believe and understanding in the truth in which we are going to invest our lives is important because what we believe determines what we and how we behave. I don't know if any of you have seen the news this morning, but uh, it was panic in Hawaii yesterday. Absolute panic in Hawaii yesterday. The emergency alert system, due to human error, malfunctioned, and all of Hawaii 
heard the emergency system go off thinking there was a ballistic missile incoming to Hawaii. I'm not making this up. If you're sitting there thinking, what? You, you'll see it when you check your internet or, or, or go online today. Hotels ushered guests down to basement levels. Businesses closed. The military and police forces were put on a state of readiness. Everybody in Hawaii believing that, that a ballistic missile was taking their way. And so, as, as my internet homepage said this morning, paradise became panic. You see, what we believe determines how we behave. <coughs> Let me kind of illustrate this in a little lighter note. And before I tee up this illustration, I, I need to say to you, um, my sister, Susie, and many of you know her, uh, she's 14 months younger than I am, but I want you to know I was and am a really good big brother. I just want you to know that before I tee up this illustration. I am. I'm a good guy with my sister. But every once in a while, you know, the big brother's just got to come out. It's just, it's just going to kind of seep out every once in a while. And I remember one time, uh, my sister and I were uh, students up the street, not far from here, at Woodrow Wilson Middle School. And, uh, and so we would walk to school. And uh, I was, I think, about eighth grade. She was seventh grade. And so normally, I would be the first one to wake up. And so, you know, a lot of times I would go in and wake Susie up if, if she was still sleeping or whatnot. We'd kind of get ready to do our thing. And then, you know, we'd walk to the walk Woodrow together. Now, Susie always went to bed earlier than I did. She went to bed about 9.30 or 10 o'clock. I would go to bed maybe about 11 o'clock. And so anyway, so one night, you know, I come up and I'm getting ready for bed. It's about 11 o'clock or thereabouts. And my sister Susan is just, just sound asleep in her bed. And, uh, and so anyway, so I go into her room and I act like I'm just all, all excited. And I wake her up. I say, Susie, Susie, Susie. I said, you got to get up. We've overslept. We've got to be at Woodrow in 15 minutes. Get up. She pops up out of the bed and looks around and, and runs down the hall to the bathroom and begins to brush her teeth and begins to wash her face and she's got long hair, so she's up all about the hair and she, you know, doing all this stuff, doing all this stuff, and she's in a bath. So I let that go for about five minutes. It's just delicious. <laughs> and I said, Susie, it's 11.10 at night. We don't have to be in school for another eight hours. And, uh, and so she, she behaved based on what she, in that moment, believed. And you know, one day I'll repent for that, but not yet. <laughs> I will repent for that one day, but not yet. But what we, what we believe does determine how we react, how we respond, what we, what, what we do, and the attitudes that we have. And whether it's just something momentary, or whether it's something far more deep and long-term and lasting, such as how you and I invest our lives, and what we choose to believe in, and who we choose to believe in, what we believe is critical. And so this morning, as we think about Pilate's question, what is truth? And as we think about what Jesus says, not only in that moment, but then what he says in John chapter 14 to, to his disciples, that statement, I am the way and the truth. I am the truth and the life. I want to say this. You know, in, in our culture, there are, there are two great deceptions that come at us in regards to this matter of truth and, and what is truth. One deception is, is relativism. And relativism suggests to us that there is absolutely no such thing. Absolute truth does not exist. It's just, it's just not, it's just not there. And so that's that's relativism. And uh, and that that idea, that notion, does saturate our culture. That there is no such thing uh, as truth. And then the other is subjectivism. And subjectivism suggests that that I determine what is true, and and I determine that submitting to no authority outside of myself. Submitting to no authority outside of myself. 
And so when you and I look around at all of the messages that, that our culture <coughs> sends to us about this matter of truth, it, it tends to be saturated either with relativism, that there is no such thing, or subjectivism, that, that you are your own truth, you don't submit to any authority outside of yourself, and uh, what, what you deem to be right is right for you. And there we are. And there we are. But against this, against this, stands the word and the person of Jesus Christ. And what we have, have seen here in John chapter 14 and John chapter 18. In, in Greek thought, much as in our own thought, there really are kind of two working definitions of truth. One is that truth is stating correctly what one perceives. And so you and I could say, for example, well, he told the truth. He told the truth. He, he, he related correctly what he, what he perceived. And that's one working definition of truth. But it is the second definition of truth that I want us to, to think about this morning. And that is that truth is that which is absolutely real and complete. That which is absolutely real and and it is in that second working definition that Jesus is using the term here in John chapter 14. And when he says, I am the truth, he is telling his disciples that I am absolutely what is real and I am absolutely what is complete. I am the embodiment of truth. And Jesus uh, says that and he reminds us that in Christianity, truth is not about what, but about who. You know, in John uh, chapter 1, verse 14, and I put it in your, in your worship guide, the Gospel writer says, We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so for us as Christians, truth is not an abstract theory, it's not a what, but it is a who. It is the person of Jesus Christ. In John 8, 32, Jesus says this, If you hold to my teachings, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And so this, this morning, I want us to focus upon free from what? Free from what? What practically can believing in Jesus as the embodiment of truth mean for you and for me today? And how we live our lives. And how we live our lives. So what is it? What does Jesus as truth release us from? And that's really what that word free means. It means to be released, to be liberated, as if one had been held captive by something else. And so now one has gained liberation, one has gained release, has been set free from that which had, had uh, held them captive or held them in, in bondage. And so what does is, what is Jesus as truth release us from? And this morning I want to suggest to you three things. Three things. One is that Jesus as truth releases us from the penalty of sin. You know, we've spent many, many Sunday mornings talking about that. That Jesus came so that you and I might be set free, might be released from the penalty of sin, which, which is death. That we might be released from the power of sin and death over us. And as David prayed in the opening prayer this morning about the resurrection, that you and I come this morning as people who have been set free. That in Jesus' resurrection, we gain grace, we gain forgiveness, we gain eternity. And so one of the things that Jesus, as truth, as the embodiment of truth, releases us from, frees us from, is from sin and from death. The penalty and powers thereof. But I want to share with you two other things. That when we understand Jesus as the truth, that he also releases us. He releases us from misconceptions about ourselves. From misconceptions about ourselves. I want you to, to understand that from the Christian worldview, from the witness of Scripture, you and I's true identity is found in Jesus Christ. That it is in relating to Him and being engaged in His presence and engaged in that relationship that you and I understand who we really are. And so all of those misconceptions that we might have about ourselves, whether they be positive or negative, can melt away because we see our true identity in and through Him. I want to give you what for me is one of the most moving illustrations of this 
in Scripture, it's one of my favorite stories in the, in the New Testament. It comes there in the Gospel of Luke, and it's, it's about the story of Zacchaeus. And it's probably one of my, my favorite stories because it's one that I remember from, from growing up as a, as a kid in Sunday school. You know, you always remember the odd stuff, do you not? You always remember the odd stuff. So if I were to say, you know, Jonah, you, you would immediately think, oh yeah, got, got swallowed by the fish. Because it's the odd element of the story. And so when I say Zacchaeus, for those of you that are familiar with the story, oh yeah, he was a guy that climbed up in the tree. We always remember the odd stuff. The unfortunate thing is, it's the odd stuff that is not the meat of the story. But it tends to be that which we remember most. So we, we go back to, to Zacchaeus, and uh, Jesus is, is in Zacchaeus' town. And Zacchaeus climbs the tree, that's what we remember, so that he can get a good view. Jesus passes by and he looks up at Zacchaeus, and I'm paraphrasing here, he looks up at Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, I want you to come back, I'm going to have dinner with you tonight. In your home. And so Zacchaeus climbs down out of the tree, and then the crowd begins to murmur. They did a lot of that in Jesus' day around Jesus. They begin to murmur, and they begin to murmur. Oh, no, oh, he, you know, he, look who he's hanging out with tonight. A tax collector. A sinner. Look at who he's hanging out with tonight. You see, they had a lot of misconceptions about who they were. You with me? Because as soon as you begin to point fingers at other people and say, oh, look at them, look at that, that's a sinner, you know, that means you have a serious misconception about who you are. So the crowd had a serious misconception about themselves, and so uh, they begin to murmur about Jesus going to hang out with a guy like Zacchaeus. And then there's an interesting thing, and for me this is the most important thing that happens in this story about Jesus' engagement with Zacchaeus. Not that he was up in the tree, as odd and, and memorable as that is. It's what Zacchaeus says in the very next verse after the folks began to murmur. Zacchaeus says in the, in the very next verse, it says that he stood up, and this is what he said. He said, here and now, I'm going to give half of what I own to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody, I will return to them four times whatever they will owe tax. Now you may say, well, that's you know, it's nice for that guy to do. Now here's what is amazing to me about that story. Jesus did not ask him to do that. The crowd murmurs, oh, what a sinner. That's verse 8. Here and now I give half of what I own to the poor, and I will return to anybody I've cheated four times what, what they are owed. That's verse 9. There is nothing in between verse 8 and verse 9 where Jesus looks at Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, by the way, you're a tax cheat. You are living off of uh, a dishonest practice of collecting taxes. So here's what I want you to know. I want you to give half of what you owe to charity, and you're going to go back and look at your account books and look at your ledgers. You're going to deal through, uh, go back and deal with all of that, and you're going to rectify all of that by giving people four times whatever you have overtaxed them. Okay? You got that, Zacchaeus? That is not verse 9. What happened? Why is it that Zacchaeus, without being prompted, without being asked, without being directed by Jesus to do that, does that? Because Zacchaeus has been set free from misconceptions about himself. He now realizes who he is and what he's done. And so then he prompts reflects that in these commitments that he then makes. I give half of what I own to the poor, and I'm going to rectify those that I've, I've overtaxed. Zacchaeus then becomes liberated materially, relationally, with everybody in the town, spiritually. Because he now knows who he is. And he can respond to that. Because he has encountered the one who is the truth. Dennis Willard, who was, uh, he's now deceased, but was for many, many years a Christian theologian and philosopher out at UCLA, uh, at, at UC Berkeley, uh, talked about what happens 
to you and to me based upon the words of the scripture when we encounter, when we embrace, when we engage in relationship with Jesus Christ. He said three things happen. He said first thing is vision. He said once we become related and connected to Jesus Christ, we gain a vision of the person we can be. Of the vision that God has for your life and for my life as a result of engaging and relating in and with Jesus Christ. He says, second thing that we that we gain is means. We, we gain the resources by which we can make that vision happen in our life. And then he said, the third thing that comes to us as a result of being engaged in Jesus Christ and relating to Jesus Christ is intention. You and I actually desire to have that happen. Desire to have that happen. And so when Jesus says, the truth shall set you free, I shall set you free, I am the truth, he releases us from misconceptions about ourselves so that we can be who we truly are in God. The one who created us and who knows us best. And we can have a vision and we can have means and we can have the right intentions and begin to then move in that right direction to become the person, the true person, the true identity that you and I were created. A third thing that Jesus as truth sets us free from, releases us from, is misconceptions about God. And you know, I think that's what is at the heart here of John chapter 14. As these disciples had moved with Jesus throughout his ministry, they encountered all kinds of people who had all kinds of ideas about God. And the problem was Jesus didn't really square with their ideas about God. And there it was all the kind of rub and the murmuring and all the kinds of, of things that came against Jesus and his disciples because people had all these ideas and conceptions about God. None of them were right. And Jesus just didn't fit that. And so Jesus says to his disciples, always remember this. If you have known me, you have known the Father. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. You want to know God? Here he is. Here he is. I am the truth. I am the truth. You know, C.S. Lewis, and I'm going to close with this, C.S. Lewis said that, that you and I really have only three options when it comes to Jesus Christ. Three, three choices that we can make and have what we believe about Jesus Christ. And these are the three. He said, number one, you can believe that Jesus Christ was completely mad. Mad. Because he said, anybody who believes themselves to be God that is not God is deluded. Is deluded. And so he said, that's option number one. Jesus was mad. Jesus was, was mentally deluded. He said, option number two is Jesus was an outright liar. He said, because anybody that believes and teaches, anybody that teaches that they are God, but knows that they are not, in other words, they have their mental faculties, they know they're not God, but they're going to tell everybody that they are, that they're a liar. And they're doing that with intention. And so he said, that's option number two. He said, option number three is to believe that Jesus was who he claimed to be. That he was God. That he was the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. And so C.S. Lewis said, one option that is not available to us, but which you and I in a relative and subjective culture often hear about Jesus is, well, he was a good man, he was a moral teacher. But that's all I'm going to say about it. C.S. Lewis said there's no way that anybody can be a good and moral teacher who claims something about themselves that they themselves know not to be true. A good and moral teacher would never lie. So that is not an option. Either Jesus was mad, or he was a liar and knew it, or he was God. He was who he claimed to be. He was the truth. And so again,